Namaste and welcome to this new episode of the Bharat Vata podcast. My name is Ashish Chandorkar and I along with Amit Paranspe today will host a very eminent guest. Uh, we have with us Mr. Gautam Bambavle, a retired Indian diplomat and a distinguished official. He has served in Pakistan, China, USA, Germany and undertaken several critical roles in Delhi during his career. Uh, Ambassador Bambavle is for, foremost expert on China, having served Indian missions in Hong Kong and Beijing. He also served as India's first Consul General in Guangzhou, and his last posting was as the Indian Ambassador to China. Uh, he now lives in Pune. Many thanks, Ambassador Bamavale, for joining us today for talking to Bharat. Thank you, Ashish, and it's a great pleasure to be with all of you. Right. Uh, with me also is Amit Paranswe today, who you have heard several times on the podcast, uh, speaking on history, technology, science, and startups. Today, Amit will help take questions on foreign policy and diplomacy with Ambassador Bimavale. Amit, over to you. Thanks, Ashish, and uh, always great to uh, talk to you, Ambassador Bimavale. We are uh, going to have a very interesting discussion uh, for the next hour or so. There are a lot of questions we want to cover. Let's see how, how many we can, uh, we can cover. So obviously, the first topic and the first question is, is China. And a lot has happened uh, over the last year. China has been in the news everywhere, whether it's India, whether it's globally. And uh, what we would like to start with is get your perspective, a 50,000 foot uh, perspective of uh, what exactly happened and where does it leave us right now. Uh, I want to get your perspective on India, but also globally would like to understand your perspective after what happened in 2020. Thank you very much, Amit, for that very uh, interesting question, but also, as you said, a very uh, sort of large uh, perspective question. Um, now, as you know that in geopolitics or across the globe, what has been the one big story over the last, say, 30, 35 years has been the rise of China. The rise of China one as an economic power, now the second largest economy in the world in nominal GDP terms, the rise of China as a military power with a growing military footprint with greater uh, platforms, uh, both naval, air force and, uh, and army. Uh, and of course, uh, growing uh, power in the world in trying to express itself and uh, you know make its views known. Now, one thing we need to remember, especially in a country like India or in all democracies, is that the political makeup of China is that of a one party system, a one party state, which is increasingly re-centralized under the current leadership of uh, President and General Secretary Xi Jinping. So uh, what is happening is that China is increasingly getting re-centralized. There is uh, basically, uh, one person is uh, trying to run the country, uh, and in a large country like China, that uh, of course, uh, you know, it has implications, which we will try to get into. So this is the big picture thing that there has been the rise of China, which has alarmed, of course, some of the other countries like the Western democracies, the United States in particular, because China is now, in terms of uh, size, economy, military, etc. Uh, now beginning to uh, almost challenge the United States preeminence in the world. As far as India is concerned, of course, uh, we share a border, an undefined, undemarcated border with China. And that makes the relationship extremely difficult and extremely um, complex. And this is what we have seen played out over many, many uh, years now, uh, not just in 1962 when we had a border flare up, but also uh, after 1976, when the India-China relationship sort of resumed a more normal trajectory. And particularly after 1988, when our then Prime Minister, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, visited China and put into place a certain understanding on the basis of which India-China relations could proceed. So I'm going to stop there, Amit, so that uh, you know the rest of the questions could come from. I there. think uh, I think that's that's an excellent uh, context setting. Uh, obviously, we want to get into a lot of depth behind each of these topics, and time permitting, we also want to talk about uh, Pakistan and uh, U.S. as well, and some other uh, overall Indian foreign policy. Uh, objectives and uh, policies 
but uh, let let me come back to china one of the thoughts that uh, uh, we have strategic planning and china's vision and uh, the fact that they have been looking out uh, 10 years 20 years 100 years we hear a lot about uh, sunzu the, the the strategist and basically we hear a lot about how you know democracies look at the next election and how china has been looking out way out into the future uh, is this something like a grand design that they have been working towards in 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 your assessment in terms of domination or they've just suddenly come to the realization that they are the number two economy and they need to uh, to use a simple term throw their weight around or is this moving for some very systematic plan that's been there for a, for a long time that's a very good follow up and second question amit so let me try answering that from my perspective uh, the way i look at it Uh, you know you are absolutely right that from 1st october 1949 uh, china in its very long history almost as long as india 5000 years of history uh, for the very first time china came under the leadership of the communist party of china which is a very traditional marxist leninist party in the shadow or in the form of the former communist party of the soviet union now uh, all these uh, political parties normally what they do is they have a very centralized way of functioning uh, not only um, at the capital say in beijing but all the way down the line to the littlest um, province the little littlest state the littlest uh, city uh, of china uh, so you have this very centralized system of uh, of operations in the communist party of china and as you know that when the communist party took over on the 1st of october 1949 when mao zedong stood up at the uh, gate of heavenly peace the tiananmen as it is called uh, in beijing and proclaimed that the chinese people have risen she was still a very um, backward poor uh, relatively undeveloped economy uh, very broadly uh, of the same size as india in fact let me share with you that in 1980 so much after 1947 when india became independent and mm-hmm. 1949 when china uh, was the, was uh, you know became the the uh, the people's republic of china uh, e- even in 1980 the rough size of the indian economy and the chinese economy was uh, more or less the same china's gdp at, in 1980 was 305 billion us dollars and india's was 189 billion us dollars but from there the fast pace growth that has occurred in china particularly in the 40 years between 1980 and 2020 has seen china grow at roughly 10% every year uh, its gdp grew at about 10% every year so that today she is roughly a 14 and a half trillion dollar economy and though india has done well since 1991 when we embarked on our economic restructuring uh, giving uh, private uh, enterprise more role in our economy uh, we have reached a figure of 2.9 trillion dollars so uh, what has happened is a huge gap has opened up between india and china in 2020 and 2021 this year compared with 1980 now to go back to your question Uh, as far as uh, international affairs were concerned uh, deng xiaoping who was the leader of uh, china uh, starting from 1976 um, so definitely in this period from 1980 onwards which i spoke about he had this uh, very good policy of hide your strength and bide your time so he felt that china should hide its strength and bide its time and focus entirely on its economic uh, regeneration its economic growth its economic development and that is exactly what she has done but uh, by 2012 november when xi jinping took over as the uh, numero uno of the chinese communist party there was a huge change in china's position in the world in terms of economics military etc and he obviously felt that china should have her place in the sun and therefore since then he has been following a more let me say a forward leaning a more aggressive a more assertive foreign policy uh, which we have seen particularly in the last uh, one year to 18 months uh, 2020 and some part of 2021 right and uh, obviously one of the impact or implication of that has been uh, 
the crisis last year uh, in Galwan and and what's been happening in in, in Ladakh. And uh, while we have seen uh, some disengagement uh, uh, there, uh, the the border issue is still very much very much there, and uh, we we share a long border. Uh, so. What what do you think uh, is is uh, the status there, and how would uh, China and India deal with this uh, in the coming months, in the coming years? And I'm going to have to ask a question to you on this about about uh, the trade implications of that as well. Yeah. Yes, I think that's a this is a very important question because I find uh, uh, Amit and Ashish that. Uh, many people in India don't really understand the implications of what has happened on our borders between China and India since last year, since roughly early May of 2020. Uh, they always say that, you know, but in the past also there have many been many sort of dust-ups between India and China on the border. And they point to three or four separate incidents, one which took place in a place called Depsang, also in Ladakh in 2013. Another took place in 2014, also in Ladakh at a place called Chumar. Uh, and that was while uh, President Xi Jinping was paying an official visit to India. And then, of course, more recently in 2017 at Doklam, which is in Bhutan, uh, but which was also something that people point to. So a lot of ordinary people, and I'm happy that I've got this opportunity to do your Bharat Varta podcast because I want people to understand that what has been happening on our border, particularly in Ladakh since 2020, is totally different from these three other incidents which have happened in 2013, 14, and 17. And uh, why and how it is different is as follows. In 2013, 14, and even to an extent at Doklam in 2017, uh, there were smaller numbers of troops which uh, got um, into a fracas with each other. And then there was a close proximity situation. Uh, there was a slight buildup of troops in the rear um, uh, by both countries, just to be careful. Uh, but these two, these three incidents didn't come uh, anywhere in, uh, in terms of magnitude of what has happened in May of 2020, when the Chinese People's Liberation Army mobilized huge numbers of troops, several divisions of troops going up to, as you must have read, 40, 50,000 soldiers, and India did a matching buildup. Not only did they move the troops, they also moved heavy artillery, heavy armor. There were tanks. You saw uh, photos of that when the disengagement process took place at, uh, at uh, Pankong Lake. Right. Uh, so uh, this was a big difference from uh, the earlier uh, incidents, which were much smaller in size and scale and which were therefore slightly easier uh, to, uh, to, uh, to resolve, but also more importantly, slightly easier to understand. What happened in those instances was that uh, stray patrol parties from both countries, India and China, military patrols of India and China came accidentally face to face with each other. Then, uh, you know, they wouldn't back down and then it led to, uh, you know, a process of slight buildup of troops and then a resolution. This time it is quite different because what the Chinese have done is that they have moved such huge numbers of troops uh, when the alternative to that was to be continue to talk with the Indian leadership and with India. We were discussing the boundary uh, problem, the brown boundary question between India and China for many, many years. So the question to ask is why did they move these troops? And the answer in my opinion, and which is what is so uh, different and therefore we should take it very seriously, is that the Chinese felt that now there was sufficient asymmetry in military, economic, and geopolitical power between the two countries. And therefore, they could uh, do what they wanted militarily. Instead of talking to, the, to India, they felt that they could unilaterally resolve the boundary by moving their troops to where they thought the line of actual control uh, should lie or uh, does lie. And I think, uh, uh, so they are trying to unilaterally resolve this problem by moving their troops right up to their idea of where this line of actual control is. But I think the this is a kind of 
uh, tactical implication of the moves that they made. What is more alarming is the strategic implications and which, as I uh, said earlier, flowed from the fact that they felt that they had enough power to suppress India. And I would even go to the extent of saying bully India uh, and use uh, military coercion against India. So the from a strategic point of view, that what they were trying to signal to us is that, look, Bachu, you are very small compared to what we are in terms of size, economic strength, military power, and geopolitical, um, uh, you know, our position geopolitically. And you must understand your place in this fast evolving scenario, this fast evolving situation, particularly in Asia, but also uh, around the world. Now, the fact that India, uh, you know, moved matching forces uh, to, uh, to tackle the Chinese uh, advance and to tackle the Chinese threat. Uh, and now we have been able to get uh, what I believe is a fairly uh, reasonable, it's a win-win for both sides, uh, disengagement in one sector. There are other sectors where this uh, true buildup still continues. But what India was indicating by doing all this was that we will not take your military coercion and your threats lying down. We will match you militarily. And we will also ensure that if we cannot have peace and tranquility in our border areas, in Ladakh and other parts of the India-China border, then the rest of the India-China relationship cannot continue to be what it was in the past. You cannot right. just trade with us and invest in India as if nothing else has happened and uh, nothing else matters. And uh, you know that uh, uh, you know in 2018, for example, China had a huge trade surplus of almost 50 billion five zero billion right, right. in a bilateral trade with India. So India has clearly indicated that we will not tolerate this bullying. We will also, um, you know, we will do what we need to do. The rest of the relationship will be impacted as it uh, was uh, done, you know, with the decisions taken by the central government of banning Chinese apps, making it more difficult for Chinese investment to come into India. So, uh, you know, taking more scrutiny of Chinese investment, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and of course, also on the geopolitical front, uh, the movement in the Quad over the last few months, including to come to that, yeah. leaders <laughs> of the Quad countries. So, uh, I, I, right. I hope I have been able to explain to you and your. No, I think you 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 have you have you have uh, you have explained it in a in a real real excellent level of detail. But the question I was trying to get into after this, well, now there are two questions. One is I, I, I do want to get to the paper uh, that, that you published, the led uh, uh, the paper for Pune International Center, uh, which focuses on what next for from our standpoint. But, but, but even, even before that, uh, I want to, want to discuss, uh, see there are two schools of thought that uh, we hear uh, in India, and you're, you're probably the best person to, to, to clarify that. One view is uh, China, as you use the word bullying, always wanted to bully us and make us stand that they are the absolute power in Asia and they don't want India to be, you know, the second power or second one power in this region. So they want, they want to make their stand very clear all along. And that's why they will use every opportunity to show India their place from, from their, their point of view. Uh, the other viewpoint that we hear in this context is, well, the recent stand by India on uh, the Belt and Road Initiative or with Quad, you, you also mentioned it, that's what I was going to come to, is something that has made China more uh, worried. Worried may be a strong word, but maybe more apprehensive and they are trying to be on the offensive uh, against these two decisions or these two areas that India is progressing on. So how, 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 would, you, how would you characterize this? Or this is something they've always wanted, going back to their long-term planning. Yeah, that's an excellent question also. Um, what I would say, Amit, is that those who argue the second viewpoint, which you very clearly, uh, you know, made the point uh, that, you know, that they are pushing back against certain decisions of India. Uh, I think those people have not understood uh, the nature of Chinese power, the nature of the Chinese state, the nature of uh, Chinese, uh, the China's Communist Party. And that is where, uh, you know, all this stems from. In fact, you're absolutely right. A lot of people feel in India that if we placate China, then there will be peace on our borders. And I'm afraid that is just not true. And the reason for that, as I have tried to argue in my earlier 
uh, in the earlier question that you raised with me was that irrespective of what india does and isn't india free to take its own decisions don't we say that you know we should be atmanirbhar we should be non aligned we should have strategic autonomy in decision making so if we want to gang up with the quad countries why can't we do that on our own the chinese can do what they want yes sure but we will push back so i don't accept the second argument at all because it doesn't understand this argument there is a big fallacy in it the fallacy is the nature of the chinese state and the nature of chinese power which will continue to push at you whatever you do you placate them give some space to them they will continue to push you so i i think uh, i tend to agree with the way we have handled it so far and i will come to the pic paper also uh, amit but the way we have handled it so far is we have in, we have said we have uh, asked our military and our troops to block the chinese advance and definitely in the pankong lake we have blocked the advance uh, especially the terms on which this disengagement has taken place uh, and uh, what we have indicated to china is that if there is no peace on our borders the rest of the india china relationship is going to be negatively impacted and which it should because if someone keeps pushing at you yes. suppose uh, you know, let me take the example of school boys in a school say youngsters of the age of 12 or 13 uh, if someone comes and pushes you will you just accept his pushing or will you push back you know that if you accept his pushing he is going to continue pushing you and only when you push back you will find that the the bully uh, you know sort of takes notice um, they may it may be just bravado but it may also be you know part of his nature so we need to push back and i completely agree with the line we have taken that the rest of the relationship is impacted i think there is no doubt at all that the rest of the relationship has been impacted and that india should take steps which are necessary to strengthen itself and in our paper what we argue uh, amit and i'll try to summarize it uh, in our paper what we argue is that this will have to be done in one the short term and two the long term in the short term because india is uh, weaker than china as we have uh, you know explained if you just look at gdp as an indicator of uh, national strength then there's a huge asymmetry between india and china so if you just take that you will see that we are weaker so in the short term we will have to build balancing coalitions with uh, with groups of other countries it may be in the form of the quad with the united states japan and australia it could be with other countries we have argued that there are about 20 countries in the world with which we can consider having close uh, coalitions close uh, balancing coalitions uh, which are uh, mainly in three categories one is the category of the major democracies of the world secondly is in the category of those countries which are bordering or neighboring to china which includes russia by the way and the third category those which are in india's Uh, periphery like bangladesh and uh, sri lanka so we believe that we need to build these balancing coalitions to balance china in the short term in the longer term we need to ensure that our economic game is uh, is much improved we resume uh, 8% gdp growth uh, china has already started slowing down it is 6 6.25 uh, we have taken uh, a figure of about uh, over the next 20 years of about 5% and if you project these growth rates 8% for india 5% for china uh, to 2047 when india is 100 as a independent country uh, you will find that our gdp india's gdp in ppp terms will be roughly 64 trillion us dollars china's will be roughly 89 trillion us dollars but the uh, difference would have gap definitely comes down so this is what the gap could have reduced yeah, yeah. we would have also become immeasurably more uh, powerful right. in terms of economics etc so right. this is what we have argued in the in the paper we have also suggested some areas where uh, where we can actually take measures and steps i think the pli policy of the government is one such example it's a good start but it needs to develop further over the next 20 years yeah and i think that that itself will be a big separate discussion the paper uh, that that you have published i'll encourage our our uh, viewers to take a look at that uh, we'll put a link up for that as well uh, there are a lot of other topics to cover beyond china as well but before we move on ashish you want to uh, jump in with any uh, questions 
Yeah, I just one curiosity question. So we had a long negotiation with China with respect to the border dispute. Uh, what is the role typically of the defense ministry versus the foreign ministry? Just for your viewers to understand, like what roles do the two departments, two two ministries play uh, in such negotiations? No, so you see that uh, you know the fact is that on the ground the two militaries are in close proximity situations in Ladakh. and in fact over the years when india and china had um, created various kinds of mechanisms for ensuring peace on the border uh, we had put into place that there would be certain areas where there would be local commanders meetings so for example in uh, in uh, in ladakh there is a particular place where the local commanders used to meet even otherwise and they would very often when the, when the border was peaceful they would meet say for example uh, uh, today is holi so the commanders would meet together with a group of their soldiers uh, at uh, the meeting point in uh, uh, in that part of ladakh and they would exchange sweets etc and greetings etc so this was uh, one of the reasons why uh, we had set up those border personal meeting points but it was also for uh, discussing other issues which could crop up from time to time and so uh, this time around starting uh, as far back as i think the first meeting started in july or june etc uh, the the military commanders the local commanders of the two countries of the two armies were meeting also but then later on we also added a diplomatic component from you know some people from the ministry of external affairs so that it became a uh you know a diplomat plus soldier uh, combination not only on our side but also on the chinese side so uh, this is what uh, is the nature of the talks which uh, are happening in ladakh and we have had one more round after the disengagement in uh, pankong so has been successful we are now moving and discussing other areas where we uh, think that this kind of disengagement could also take place so that's the nature of the interaction between india and china So, uh, so let's let's move on now to our other neighbor that <laughs> these days we don't talk about a whole lot, but uh, has been has been an issue uh, for us uh, ever since uh, ever since independence. And you have been an uh, ambassador or say a high commissioner uh, uh, to Pakistan as well. Uh, so uh, curious to get your view on what has changed recently in the last month, especially. uh there's there's been talk about ceasefire there has been some some good comments being made uh by the leadership on both sides uh uh the hawks on our side typically say that again we are back to that same thing where every few years we go through this phase of having some um, peace discussions exchange of some delegations maybe a couple of uh, cricket match series and then we again regress uh uh is it the same is it different what has what has been the trigger first of all for this this reengagement of sorts no actually um, i can only guess uh, at what could have been the trigger i really don't know because i'm not i mean i study pakistan sitting far away here in pune but uh, one can only guess what is the pulls and pressures on the leadership of pakistan but i i think the current offer to uh, resume the ceasefire in across the line of control between pakistan and india uh, must have been necessitated due to economic pressures which are working out in pakistan and these economic pressures had started well before uh, the pandemic struck but i think they have got exacerbated or ex- accelerated due to the pandemic and uh, th- that pressure is as follows that increasingly you find that in pakistan it is the armed forces the military forces which take a large part of the cake uh, of gdp in pakistan so yeah. the amount of uh, resources which are going to the pakistan armed forces has been increasing those being left over for the rest of society have been decreasing and therefore you find that pakistan does not able to, is not able to increase uh, in any significant manner the uh, uh, expenditure on say education or public health uh, which are you know uh, items of expenditure where all countries want to uh, do better uh, so that their people are uh, healthy and well educated uh, so i think this is one of the pressures which must have worked and uh, what i think is important about this particular offer of ceasefire and keeping the loc quiet is that it has come from their army chief uh, 
If it had come from the Prime Minister of Pakistan, I wouldn't have paid much attention to it because we all know, and it's a fact, that it's the army which calls the shots in Pakistan and not so much the Prime Minister. So that used to be a problem for us in the past. Uh, and I can give you just one example. In 2015, when Prime Minister Modi and the then Prime Minister of Pakistan, Nawaz Sharif, met at a place called Ufa in uh, Russia, and they were both there for some international meeting. Um, uh, it was uh, something to do with uh, the SCO, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, they came away with uh, some kind of written agreement. But the moment uh, the Prime Minister of Pakistan returned to Islamabad, there were critics who tore the uh, agreement apart and it was never implemented. So my point is that there's no point in discussing it with people who cannot Im help uh, implement their uh, agreements. Let's right. discuss it with those who perhaps can. Yeah. Uh, and which brings me to the last point that, you know, I, I tend to agree that I don't know whether this current move is just tactical for a few months, a few years, uh, or whether it is something which is more serious. But I am the first one to agree that we should explore it with Pakistan, with the Pakistan military, because they have offered this. And let's see if they're serious about it. We will know sooner rather than later whether it's only tactical, something for a few months, which gives them some breathing space, and then they're back to business as usual, <laughs> or whether it is something more serious, which of yeah. course we should also um, welcome. Course. We participate in it if it is a serious move to uh, to have some kind of understanding between Pakistan and India. Is, is this something that could be related to the fact that they were counting a lot on the Chinese for help, including economic help? and also from the Middle East. And uh, they have sort of been given, an, I won't call it a lukewarm, but not as great uh, support or feedback that they were counting on from China, from the Middle East, uh, their friends in the Middle East. And they have come to the realization that they are on their own and they need to, exactly as you said, you know, watch for their expenses. Could be, could be. Um, and it, that would add up to all the economic pressures building up inside Pakistan within the Pakistan economy, of course, because to a large extent, they are dependent on these, um, let me call them handouts from uh, <laughs> yeah. countries like Saudi Arabia, UAE, and even China. Though the right. Chinese, of course, as you know, Amit and, uh, and Asif, the Chinese always give bank loans at uh, commercial rates of interest, which have to be repaid. So um, they're not uh, you know, they're not handouts, they are meant to be <laughs> paid back and repaid back, which also continues to add a debt burden on the Pakistan right. economy. So right. it could be. Uh, if you want to want to add anything here? Uh, so my question was a related one, what Amit asked, which is that, is it something to do with the Biden administration coming into play? I mean, like both countries don't know what to expect from the US. Uh, the, the previous administration was perceived to be closer to India which uh, that equation may have changed now. So is that uh, one of the factors? Uh, I personally, I don't think so, um, Ashish. I don't think it is so much the Biden administration, but but you're not wrong in the sense that there are other forces at play in, uh, in Pakistan's periphery and mainly in Afghanistan, where there is, um, where the Americans have been saying, not only under President Trump, but even under President Biden, that they will withdraw their forces from Afghanistan and leave Afghanistan to its own people, etc. Uh, so that is a factor which would also have uh, played a role. I, I don't know how much of a role it has played, how important it was in this decision. My guess is it may have been a minor factor, but nothing very major. So uh, I, I would uh, uh, respond to your question in that way, Ashish. Uh, coming coming to uh, Amer the American perspective, uh, I think uh, we have seen an interesting in exchange uh, just a few weeks after the new administration took over. Uh, obviously, there was the, the meeting, uh, the quad meeting between the four heads of state, but we have seen uh, uh, the Secretary uh, of State Austin uh, come here. Uh, John Kerry may be, may be visiting as well the climate uh, climate envoy. Uh, so it looks like the new administration is, uh, is uh, focusing on India uh, much more than what some people, people were expecting uh, around here. Uh, how, how do you view that? Or is it, uh, uh, or is the other way of asking this is the American policy now uh, mature to the point where irrespective of what administration is there in Washington, D.C., it will sort of continue at, at uh, the same pace or on the same course. Yeah. 
No, with respect to uh, that's a, that's a very relevant point. Um, I, I, you know, the way I look at it is that I would have expected the Biden administration to spend much more of its early days in office uh, focusing on domestic issues, domestic policies, because they need to show that they are uh, looking after the interests of the American people, jobs for the American people, etc. You know how the election campaign uh, went uh, over this last cycle. Uh, the fact that they have uh, got an excellent team on the national security side and the fact that the national security team has really hit the ground running is something which I think is welcome. Uh, and uh, the fact that, uh, you know, that the Biden administration has clearly indicated that it is back in international affairs, it will not withdraw from the WTO, it will not withdraw from the WHO, it will come back, it will continue uh, negotiations on climate change in the international um, arena. Um, and the fact that President Biden has invited 40 leaders from 40 independent and si significant countries to visit and to have this discussion and, uh, you know, his envoy Kerry uh, moving all over the world. I think this is something that uh, we are not entirely anticipated, but it's a good thing because they are showing that they are, um, you know, hitting the ground running, not just on domestic and internal matters, but also on national security and foreign affairs matters. Uh, and I think uh, India can just, uh, can only, uh, you know, can only welcome that. Uh, as far as issues are concerned, yes, there will be broad consonance between uh, Repu earlier Republican administrations and uh, now the Biden administration. But uh, obviously, all the issues which uh, traditionally animated the Democrats and the Democratic Party in the United States will continue to animate them even now, whether it is human rights or whether it is the farmers' agitation uh, outside Delhi. They don't seem to understand that that's a very small part of India. There are large swaths of India where there are no agitations. So I think those will unfortunately continue to animate uh, the Biden administration and uh, people in, in the United States Congress. Uh, we'll just have to uh, tackle it and uh, take it, uh, you know, uh, as it comes. Uh, we are expert at doing this. I don't think it will uh, shift our attention from the really big issues which are at play uh, and uh, in protecting India's uh, national interests. So I, I don't see that happening. So I think uh, one last question on on uh, America before we get into some general discussions about your your extensive career and your experience uh, working working in the IFS because we definitely want to hear hear some of uh, your experiences there as well. Uh, but uh, how how do you look at uh, uh, Quad progressing over the next three to five years? Obviously, America is a dominant partner in that, but there's, and there is Australia as well. You know, I my first uh, point here, uh, Amit, would be that I really welcome the way the first Quad Leaders Summit was uh, was organized, the way it was structured, because you see that nowhere in the public articulation of that meeting was the word China used, and I think that is very important, uh, and it is important because of the fact that the Quad now has three areas in which it is going to work: vaccines, of course. The second and 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 uh, countering the pandemic um, is the first. Um, there's climate change, and of course there is also military uh, and naval cooperation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, there are three proactive, positive areas in which they have uh, agreed to work together, and I think that itself tells a story that uh, you know these quad countries are not just coming there to create problems between. Uh, some countries on the one hand and China on the other. We are not going to um, ask uh, countries in Southeast Asia to take sides. But here we are contributing to the global good, the, to the public good. And I think that is a very important message which has come out and we should continue on that, uh, on, on that uh, uh, wavelength as we move ahead in the Quad. How serious the Quad will become, uh, you know, how uh, it will move forward. Will there be a secretariat? Etc. is something that we, you know, will have to be played by ear. 
uh, as it moves forward and as it, uh, it, uh, it develops. But there is one idea which I can share with you, which, uh, you know, a, a lot of people in the Quad countries and the governments of the Quad countries have been talking about. And that is so far, we have only been doing joint military exercises. So, for example, the latest uh, version of India's naval exercises, the Malabar naval exercise, we had invited Australia and all four countries, India, USA, Japan, Australia participated in it. We are now thinking or they are now thinking because I'm outside the government. So uh, I'm only looking at things and analyzing them from outside. But uh, I think they are now thinking of moving from joint maritime exercises to joint maritime operations. And that will be a big uh, move and a big change, yeah. which will send its own signals to, right, uh, right. including to China, that, you know, they should take the Quad seriously, that uh, their foreign minister had once described the Quad as the sea foam, which will hit the shore and just, you know, sort of <laughs> melt away. So you can see that uh, the Quad is not sea <laughs> foam, which will melt away. It is there to stay. I think that's that's a very good uh, good perspective. I think uh, we have about five, 10 minutes more. So we wanted to talk about something a little bit uh, uh, different uh, to close. Uh, you have served in so many interesting places, so many interesting countries, uh, like uh, obviously like China, Pakistan, US. Uh, what were some of the unique challenges that we typically don't hear about uh, when it comes to serving these, uh, serving these, uh, serving at these places, especially when we have had these tough relationships uh, going back and forth. Yeah, no, absolutely. But let me start by saying that a lot of people ask me this question, that which of the countries you have worked in is your, is your favorite? No, I haven't asked them. <laughs> so you haven't asked them, a lot of other people. And my talk answer, my standard answer is that, look, when you have say two children or three children, there is no one which is favorite. So it's the same with me amongst all the countries I've served in. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself in all those countries. So there's no favorite. So let me start with that point. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, which has been most challenging uh, in terms of uh, the work and the work content and the, um, you know, we, I was uh, posted in Beijing three times at three different times in my career. And I was posted once to Guangzhou as a Consul General of India uh, in 2007 and 2009. So the second of those stints in Beijing took place. I actually reached Beijing in June of 1998, a few weeks after India had tested her nuclear devices under, the, uh, under Prime Minister Vajpayee. And you remember that at that time, uh, um, President Clinton of the United States had leaked a letter that Prime Minister Vajpayee had written to him blaming China for our nuclear tests. And the Chinese took this very uh, badly and they said, look, you, why do you have to blame us? You want to test, you go ahead and test. We're not saying anything about it, but why do you have to blame <laughs> us? Uh, President Clinton? And after that, uh, the India-China relationship went into a deep freeze, a much deeper freeze than what we are seeing right now. Uh, there was very little uh, diplomatic and other interactions we were not allowed to meet uh, ministries of the government of uh, the People's Republic of China. So we had a lot of time on our hands for almost a period of a month, maybe a couple of months. That's when I learned, uh, that was the period when uh, I, from some colleagues of mine, I learned uh, to play contract bridge. So it was not a bad, <laughs> it was not, not a bad deal. But also the relationship then improved after a couple of months when our uh, then uh, external affairs minister, Mr. Jaswan Singh, visited China and then, uh, you know, sort of uh, spoke to the Chinese leadership. So then things were more or less started getting back to normal. But I remember very clearly those two months were very challenging because uh, there was no work we could uh, transact because no Chinese person in any of their government or non-governmental uh, departments, organizations would agree to meet us. So it was a fairly challenging bit. And the second, of course, I must share with you was when I was in the United States, when we did the Indo-US nuclear deal. And one mm. of the you know, main centerpieces of the yeah. nuclear deal was to get this India specific uh, legislation through the US Congress. Uh, it's called the Henry J. Hyde Act. Uh, and to get it through the Congress, we literally 
all of us who used to work at our embassy in uh, in uh, in Washington DC and people who were asked to come over from San Francisco and Chicago and Houston and New York all of us sort of made a beeline to Capitol Hill and tried to uh, meet people uh, make friends influence them uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. also we um, you know the indian american community was mobilized and they played a very very stellar role in ensuring that that legislation passed but that was a very challenging moment but also very satisfying once the henry j hyde um, bill became an act of the united states congress and the india us uh, uh, nuclear cooperation then started from that point in time yeah great uh, and i'm sure i mean one of these days i hope you write a book about uh, your 35 years of <laughs> amazing experiences uh, because it's it's just very difficult to summarize them in in 5 or 10 minutes but ashish any any closing questions i'm sure you have a lot of questions about this, this part as well no I, i have one last question which is that uh, on the ifs is seen as a very positive service by people outside people see the work which is being put in uh, what do you think needs to be done to further strengthen the service and what else can be achieved through the ifs route yeah no i think the first and most important thing ashish is that you know india our country our nation is uh, has a much higher profile in international affairs today than say uh, in the 1950s and 1960s when we already had a pretty high profile and to protect and promote india's interest which is what uh, the ministry of external affairs the diplomatic service the indian foreign service does i think first of all we need a little more people entering uh, the service we need to have a larger service secondly um, you know i find that many people who appear for the civil services exam because it's the same exam that you give Uh, and then you have to choose will you do the ias will you do the police service will you do the customs service will you do the foreign service i think uh, you know those people who opt for the foreign service should have a very clear idea of what uh, is entailed in the work of the service and uh, in our uh, posts abroad in our missions abroad uh, and what exactly we are doing uh, because only then you will be happy uh, and you will be able to contribute as an individual to this larger um uh, effort which is done not just by uh, government but also by individual people you know i spoke to you about the indian american community and how they really rallied and and uh, were a force to reckon with on capitol hill when we did the henry j hyde uh, act uh, and um, i think that was a wake up uh, movement for me where you could see that the force of india is not so much just the government which is a tiny fraction of the entire country is the people of india which are going to make a difference and uh, in fact even in our paper uh, for the pic on how india can rise to the china challenge we are calling on the government to go beyond just governmental agreements and trade agreements to have greater interactions between the peoples of uh, countries with whom we Uh, align with or whom with whom we have a coalition so i think that is the key the people of india and uh, they can make a huge difference i think uh, we're almost out of time we could go on and on but uh, i think uh, we can stop here but uh, really hoping ambassador mumbai you can join us again uh, on bharat varta at some point of time this has been a very fascinating discussion uh, for me and i'm sure it will be for all our all our viewers we have covered a wide range of issues starting with china to america to pakistan to ifs and so many other things and uh, i have had these discussions many times with you but every time i speak with you there's always some new things to learn so i think it's it's always uh, for me personally and i would like to thank bharat varta for that as well to have this one more opportunity to have this uh, nice nice discussion with you so with that uh, thanks again and uh, ashish uh, if you want to Add any closing comments? No, this was a really fascinating discussion, Ambassador Bamavale. We don't usually hear first-hand accounts of these things. Uh, there's a lot of information and misinformation in the public domain, so it's really great to hear from you some of these perspectives. Uh, we are very enriched. Thank you so much for your presence today, uh, and look forward to hosting you again. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Bharat Varta podcast. If you want to see more content like this then don't forget to subscribe to our channel we started bharat varta to facilitate long form discussions on politics policy and culture we don't necessarily endorse anything that was said in this episode 
If you wish to offer us feedback, do reach out to us on social media. We are at Bharat Vartha on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You could also get in touch with us on our website www.bharatvartha.in. The links are in the description below. Until next time, stay safe, take care, and jai.